you're in Christ Jesus, we're both in you, the Father and the Son. And when you stand in that, I, I often I often think about someone, and and I know the person that I'm thinking about, but I'm not going to get political with it. But you you think about some somebody's kids that they've always just been completely taken care of. They've lived in a in a life in a family that that never wanted for anything. Some prince or some royal family that you know they grew up. Never knew anything but people just falling at their feet everywhere they went. And you think about how they operate in life. They, they're just, they, they completely, they look at life completely different because they've never had a want or a need ever in their life. We've got the same opportunity. We just need, we just need to have the confidence enough to stand up and say, my heavenly father owns the the cattle of a thousand hills and the hills that they walk on. He owns it all. He's, he has made us stewards of that. And these, these real prominent people we think about and we, and we talk about, they're just stewards of what God has given them. Think about what, what, we're, what we're looking at. So when I look at something like that and, and I think, I'm going to play this game to win. Why? Because he won years and years and years ago for me. He defeated the devil and put him exactly where he needs to be, under our feet. But we got to come to the conclusion that we're who we are, have confidence in where we stand, so that when something pops up that we need, I'm going to give you an example. And I've done this I don't, I, don't, I don't tell stuff like this because a lot of people look out the corner of their eye like, really? You're really that goofy enough to, to scream at a storm? I was sitting on the top of the ridge. I don't know which one it is, but it's the ridge across, completely across Chattanooga looking at Lookout Mountain. And I got in the car and it went to pitching a fit. I'm talking about storm and the car was doing this. And I just, in Jesus' name, you're stopping this mess. I ain't putting up with this wind. I mean, stop it now. Now, it rained, but the wind stopped. And I stood in authority of who I am in Christ Jesus, not because I'm anything other than a child of God, and I can expect things to happen when they do. I mean, it was. It was pissed. I told Missy, I said, there's a limb fell out of the car, out of the, out of the uh tree and hit the car or hit beside the car right beside it and I'm thinking if that had hit Missy's car she'd have shot me but it was pitching fit this morning so let's go on it's uh, Romans 6 and 4 in the King James Version it says therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Now, when I, when I read this scripture, I want to take that to heart, that every morning when I get up, I walk in the new creature that I am in Him. And whether I Stump my toe when I went to bed. I'm going to get up the next morning walking in the newness that Christ has made me to be. And, and I, I'm one of those, this is, this is the way I look at things. And I, and I try, I've, I've got this, I've become this narrow-minded about people and, and how they operate because you, have, you see so much going on in that jail and all these people there. I mean, you can tell it. They're dry, their heads are down between their legs because they have really messed up to get over here for years. Not a little bit, but for years. And I'm constantly telling them, look, are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. First John 1 and 9 says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You don't have to carry this. It, you don't have to carry it because Jesus carried it to the cross and, and it was crucified on that cross for you 
So, so when we read this, walking in the newness of life, realizing what Christ done for us, there's, there's a place that you can, you can walk in and operate in and, and really come to the place when something like that comes up and you stump your toe and things just don't go the way you think they ought to and you make a mistake, you, you, you immediately understand the grace and the finished works of Jesus Christ and what He done. And instead of running from God, you turn and say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me, I messed up. And He's faithful and just to, to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness so that you can walk in this newness of life every day of your, of your existence on this planet. The, uh, the, the New Living Translation of this verse says, For we died and were buried with Christ in baptism, by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. The, the Amplified Classic says, We were buried therefore by him, with Him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we might too habitually live and behave in the newness of life. I, spent a do- I told them today, I spent a dozen years not knowing that I could walk in that newness of life. I knew I'd been born again. I knew I'd gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ long, long before that. But religion and what had just dogged me for my entire existence on this planet pushed me to the point that I threw up my hands and just ran. Because I didn't know, when, when, when you don't know where you stand with God, when all you get when you go to the, to the church is, are you sure? What would you do last week? You preach backslide, and guess what people's going to do? They're going to backslide. I promise you that. You don't hear that at church a lot. You ain't got, I mean, I've, I've been here two years, going on three. I don't, you don't hear that here. You hear something that's going to help you succeed in your Christian life. And, and when, you, when, 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 and when you go to a church and you sit down and you get to the place that, that all you hear is how bad you are, you're going to live up to it. Kids are going to do exactly, exactly what you say to them that they are. They're going to live up to your expectations. And that ain't funny. That is not funny. I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, the sixth verse, Romans 6 and 6, the ampl- or the King James Version says, Now this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, last week, or this week rather, earlier this week, we were, ta- we were talking about sin taking over people and just ruling their lives and, and running them around by their nose. I said, well, when you, when you come to the conclusion that that old man was crucified and the only one that's going to take him off that cross is you, Right? If you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, yet that old man was crucified with him. And when you got reborn, when you got born again, that new man, that new creature was raised again, just like Christ. Now, if that old man has anything to do with you, guess who's given him the, the opportunity and the privilege to stick his ugly head back up? It ain't Jesus. It ain't the Father. It's us. And if we don't know any better, it's easily done. I didn't know any better. I spent 12 years acting like a fool because I did not know that I was far more than I'd been told I was. I'm going to read the, the New Living Translation of 6 6. It says, Now we know that our old sinful selves 
were crucified with, with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. There's been people that have come up to me in the, in the jail, and I've, I've told you this over and over. I, I don't know, I, want, I don't know, want to know what they do, but they'll say, I'm having these thoughts. These thoughts keep popping up. And believe me, if you spend right now, they're spending 23 hours a day in a six by eight cell. Shut up. Silence. There ain't nothing going on. You spent 23 hours a day in that little area. Your mind's going to run wild. Follow me? He said, and, and, and Pete, they'll come up and say, I'm having these thoughts. I say, well, I, I can't help but let them know, look, you're no different than I am. Do you, mean know how, you, do you want me to tell you how I remedy that? They say, yeah, would you please? Just, I said, just as soon as that pops up, say, Lord, thank you. That ain't my thought. Thank you that, that, that Satan's the author of lies, and that's a lie. And I'm not going to believe it. I didn't do that years ago. That thought popped up. Now, this is, this is the, this is the low-down, dirty dog that Satan is, and he will mess with you if you let him. But this is so true. He'll tempt you, poke you, prod you, push you to a place where you give in to those, those thoughts. And then, then he'll turn around and say, well, you sorry thing. And act like it was your fault. People, we've been duped into thinking that all this junk that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is us. Now, a lot of it is flesh. But I'm going to promise you, where, where does this flesh get its uh, direction from? From the devil. And he wants more than anything to keep you with your eyes and your, and your attention focused on your physical needs and what's going on around you. But what did, we, what did it say? It says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. How does it lose its power? When we renew our minds to the fact that that is true above, over, over and above the lies that the devil wants to throw at us. I know you've heard me say this over and over. You cannot help that a, that a bird flies over your head, but you can, make it, you can keep it from making a nest in your hair, getting in your head and looping. Those thoughts are going to come. They're always going to be there. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give the devil a little credit right now. He's a persistent cuss. And, it, and as long as you'll keep your mouth shut and, and let him fool your head, he's got you. But when you, when you, when you hear that, hear that uh, thoughts that comes through your mind that is contrary to what this book says, if you'll open your mouth and put that thought where it belongs, it, it will never be able to, to, to take up residence between your ears and mess you up. That's the, that's the sole reason that we need to understand it. That the old sinful man is put to death. If we're born again, we died out to sin. It's over. The only, re the only one that's going to allow that to come into our lives is us. And the devil is, is quick to let you and help you step right back off, on, off, off in that hole that you crawled out of. I know. I done it. I used to, now this is just telling stories on me. I've got a good friend, a pastor, has been a pastor for years. Thank the world of him. Me and Missy would go to his church. We'd go out to eat with him after church. And, and just, you know, we love him. We, I love him today. Do, do anything in the world to help him. But I'd be drunk for dark. That's just truth. Why? Because I was trying to carry it myself. I was doing everything I knew to do to gut it out and be strong enough to live the Christian life that I wasn't meant to carry that load to start with. 
If I'd known it 25 years before that, I'd have never been sitting at that table waiting to go home to get a drink. Right? I mean, if you knew who you are and if you know where you stand, those temptations are not there to drag on you because when those temptations come up, you say, no, that ain't me. That old man, he's dead and gone. I tell him all the time, I said, that old man that, that drank smearing off vodka like water is a dead duck. He's done. He, he's, he's gone. He don't, he, he don't exist anymore. And when, when he tries to stick his head up out of the ground, you put your foot on him and say, no, that ain't happening. I know where I stand. I'm confident in where I stand. And I want to build a confidence in every person that will listen so that we don't have to stand in this junk any longer. The church, I talked to a man today going down out of that meeting. Hadn't talked to him in years. Taylor used to shoot with him. He, I mean, Taylor was, at one time was a just a one more sporting clay shotgun. He could shoot us. A bird like nobody's business. And this man took him under his wing, and, and, and you know, we went to tournaments all over. Went to Arkansas one time with him. And uh, first, th- first, when he answered the phone, he said, hey, what's up? How's Taylor? That's the first thing he said, because Taylor was just a kid when he went shooting with him. We got to talking, and, and I said, uh, How, how's everything going? How's your family? He says, good. And we, I asked about his church, and and he said, well, he said, it used to be 400, and now he said, it's less than 100. He said, this COVID has just beat it to death. And I'm like, you know, I didn't say nothing. I'm just like, I'm biding my time because that's exactly the, the place that this message needs to be, to tell those people, look, take your place. Take your place in the kingdom. Yeah, you're born again. But stand up and know that that, that dog ain't going ain't to get in your head anymore and, and just completely run you off. I mean, this is a great old big church. And, and just dwindled down to no more than we've got in this little church on Sunday morning. It, it's sad what, happen, what happens to, to people that don't realize where they stand with Him and in Him and operating in Him. Put the New Living Translation up for that verse. It says, we know that our old, now get this, uh, the Amplified Classic, I'm sorry. We know that our old, unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our bodies, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive for evil, that we might no longer be slaves to sin. I was a slave to a vodka bottle for a long, long time. Not because I was physically dependent on it. I was dependent on it between my ears. I told him yesterday or today, I said I didn't, I didn't have any kind of uh, withdrawal when I finally quit, didn't bother me. I just knew where I stood finally in, for, you know, the, in the first time in 40 some odd years of my life. And when I started getting hold of this, it became stronger and stronger and stronger that I could stand up and see somebody struggle and not want to beat them down like most religious people do, but go over and put your arm around them, take them by the hand and say, let me help you because I know where you stand. I know where you've been. That's, that's the reason I told them, <laughs> I told them today, I said, I'm more at home in this prison over here in this jail or someplace like that or sitting on a bar stool somewhere talking to a bunch of drunks than I've ever been in front of a crowd at a church. Why? Because I've been there. I know where they sit. I know what they've done. I know how they've stumbled and staggered and tried to do everything that they, they could to break that cycle in their self. 
You follow me? We've got it backwards. We, tr- we tried to be strong enough and, and lift weights enough. You know what I'm talking about? Just be physically strong enough to, to get over things. That ain't what it's all about. Back that up but one slide, honey. It says, we know that our old, unrenewed self, that one that wasn't born again, has, was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which we still live in now, uh, our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be ineffective and inactive for evil. You say, how am I going to control myself? This is, this is a, a simple truth. Two against one will win every time. Is that correct? I've, I've seen very few men, that me and a buddy couldn't handle him if, if it come right down to it. Correct? All right, we're, we're a spirit, right? Lives in a body. And we, our, our operating system, our soul is our, wife, our mind, our will, and our emotions. All right, if you're born again, if you're born again, that inside, that spirit man wants to do right. But he's got two things working against him. This flesh that will do anything that you let it do. And a mind that if it's not renewed, a carnal mind is, is doing its best to kill itself. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So when, you, when you're born again and you renew your mind to what all these scriptures on this card says, Guess what? That's two against one. And this flesh just has to get in line. It has to. There ain't no way around it. Now, if you're carnally minded, you're going to go the flesh way every time. I done it. I was born again. Done everything I knew to do to be strong enough to live a Christian life and failed miserably for decades. But when I started renewing my mind and, and putting it in line with my born-again spirit, my flesh just had to say, well, I'm just going to have to do what I'm told instead of ruling the roost. Correct? We've got a whole nation full of people that are carnally minded. And millions upon millions, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people that have lived on this earth that have struggled their entire existence as a Christian. And many of them backslid and said, I'll never go back because I can't live it. I'll tell you a little secret about Stacy. I was born again at Samples Memorial Baptist Church on Spring Place Road. Me and her hadn't been married, I don't know, not long at all. I was at a funeral. I went to the altar and got born again. I knew, I know I did. But before I got through the doors of that church leaving, I was already defeated. The devil said, you can't do that. Ain't no way. No way. Ain't no way you can live that. You ain't strong enough. And I believed him. I struggled for the next eight, ten years. The Lord just continually feed me. I wore, I, I've got a Bible at the house, the cover's coming off of it. It wasn't like I didn't study. I studied, done everything in the world I knew to do to be what I, what I was supposed to be. But I didn't know that I could stand in faith over what that book said. I didn't know that I had to stand up in faith and say, no, devil, you've got to go. And that's it. I ain't putting up with you. Just like we're talking about that wind. I didn't put up with it. And, and when you come to that conclusion, the devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's all he's good for. There ain't nothing good comes from him. And, and we look at a lot of people that have a whole lot of stuff, and you say, I don't understand why they've got all that, and, and I'm struggling, and, and it looks like the, the devil's just blessing them left and right. Well, that's crazy. The devil ain't doing that. Uh-uh. Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Listen, think about what, you, what you're saying. Ronnie Cates told me 
years ago, right down there in front of that house in that greenhouse. He said, it, it will do you more good than anything if you'll take a piece of paper and split it right down the middle. And the good stuff you put on one side and the bad stuff you put on the other and make sure that God's on the one with the good side and the, and the devil's on the one with the bad side and don't ever get them mixed up. What did, what did Oral, Oral Roberts say? God is a good God and the, and the devil's a bad devil. And it, when, when I heard John Mathis talk about that from the pulpit, it just went off of me and yeah, they don't change places. He ain't out here. God ain't out here trying to club you over the head because you have allowed your body to take rule over your life. He's not out here trying to hurt you. He's out here trying to help you to point you to the very thing that you need. And I tell them all the time in jail, you don't need me in here. You've got everything you need to live a Christian life. And they look at me like, you're, you're a drunk. What's wrong with you? We're in jail. We ain't got nothing other than that book. You've got the Holy Spirit. Same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. And you've got God's Word, and the God's Word will never, never come back void. He'll, it'll never not do what it's supposed to do. And the Holy Spirit will always lead you and guide you to this book. And if you'll stay in this book, there ain't nothing out here in this world can conquer you. Nothing. Nothing. And when we get to the point that we understand that and walk in that and, and, and every day of our lives, regardless of what hell's breaking loose, say, no, I'm going to stand on what I know to be true. My surroundings, my circumstance, what's going on, what may have popped up in my health today, I'm not going to let that deter me from knowing and doing exactly what God wants me to do and, 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 and has given me the commission to do. And that's just not Stacy. I'm talking about every individual in this world. Because we've all got something to do in the kingdom of God. Whether it be me opening the door for this place or me preaching right here. We've all got something to do. Every one of us. That's why I'm so adamant on it and letting people know that you can be a help at Bledsoe County Prison for these women that are des in desperate need of somebody just to tell them how to do something in life. You know, Missy was talking about it. Well, our friend's been in jail for 33 years. Missy sent her a, a, a link to YouTube. She said, what's this? I don't know about YouTube. 30, think about it. 33 years ago, YouTube wouldn't even thought about it. She didn't have no idea. Getting gas. Getting gas. Now, you can get gas in the middle of the night when nobody's around. But if you don't know it, you're going to sit there till daylight and wait for somebody to open that door when you could have took your little card and swapped it on that gas pump, and it'll pump you some gas. Think about it. This world has completely changed. And when, if you spent the last five years in jail, let alone 25, you, you spend the last five years in jail, you get out and things have changed tremendously. These, these women, men, everybody over there, this whole state needs some help in these prisons. And I'm doing my dead level best to get them to see it my way. Because they, they, they're, they're like, we do things a certain way. And I said, well, can I come in? I said, he said, he pretty much gave me the okay to come in and do what I, what I do here. I said, I've got one, one question that I want, to, I want you to really think about before you answer. He said, what? I said, I've made it a point since 2018 that everything, everywhere I go, I make sure that, it's, that I record it so I can put it on, the, on my podcast so somebody can listen to it years down the road. I said, it'll help somebody. I say, can I bring in a phone? And he goes, just, just about to break his neck. No, I said, well, let me, let me ask you this. Can I bring in one that's completely turned off other than the recorder? No, no, no. But I, the longer I talked, he said, well, let me talk to the warden and this and that. He said, we're allowed to bring stuff like that in. I said, well, all I want, I said, you can carry it in for me. Just push the little button. I won't touch it. I've got a mic that we can put on here. You see what I'm talking about? Some little something like that 
When you, when you can get that leeway, you can touch a whole lot of people over in that jail. And I'm asking you to gr- agree with me that he works out. Because that's what's going to change the lives of people for them to be able to get these scriptures, these, these teachings to a, in a place that, that is really back. He, t- he said it himself. He said this, this, this prison is in the Stone Age. And he said we're just, we don't have the funds to, to get all this done. And then they got to worry about the internet getting hacked and and uh, I didn't know it, but there's some inmates somewhere stole a phone, got a phone ship, uh, smuggled into the prison, and they made a, a YouTube video inside the cell, inside the prison, and put it out on YouTube. I mean, that's, that's the things that the prison's having to deal with. Some goofy somebody trying to, you know, be funny. That I mean, what else they got to do but get into trouble? That's why I'm trying to get them out of trouble. So let's go on. I've gathered enough here. Uh, Romans 6 and 8. In the King James Version, it says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we, shall, we, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Now these three, next three scriptures are, say pretty much the same thing. The Amplified Classic says, Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. That's one of the the biggest questions that I have saw people ask their their congregations over and over and over again. Do you know that you know that you know that you know if you died today, you go to heaven? And what they're what they're really asking is, have you given your heart and life to Jesus Christ? And I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this. Don't make somebody doubt. Think about it. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. I've heard preachers stand up and spend 30 minutes trying to get somebody to doubt, second guess themselves. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you, that I ain't got no place in that. I want to get, reach up and get him by the ear and say, come here, let me talk to you. These people have a hard enough time dealing with where they stand than you to get up there and, and badger them for, for 30 and 45 minutes making sure or you want to make sure. No, lift them up. Edify them. Tell them what the Bible says about what they done is what they done, and that's exactly what they can stand on. You're talking about letting the tension and the anxiety go away to, from, a, from a group of people that, that need it going away. They need to walk through life in peace. There ain't no peace in most, most Christian lives. There's no peace there because they don't know for sure where they stand. Right? I mean, it's constant struggle. And when you go to church and you hear this, and you, and you worry about, well, am I really going to live with him? Am I where I'm supposed to be? Did I do everything right? It has nothing to do with what, what we done. It has to do with what he done. He paid the perfect sacrifice for every person on this planet to do the same thing, and that is confess him as Lord, believe in their heart that he done what he said he done, and God raised him from the dead to justify them. By faith, you stand on that truth. I'll never forget, I was on Spring Place Road at Washington Avenue Baptist Church when I read Romans 10, 9, and 10 and then turned it over to Mark 11, 23 and realized that the same recipe for salvation was the recipe to get anything else I wanted done through the same way. Confess it with my mouth and and believe it in my heart. We, We were sitting in the old choir building or the old choir, and it went up like this. And in the back, it was pretty low. And I'm talking about I just wanted to jump because I realized that, that what God said about salvation, I could take it and hold on to it to move any mountain that I ever come in contact with. Now, if you've got a group of people out here that knows that without a shadow of a doubt, 
knows, first of all, knows they're born again. Second of all, knows that, that if anything comes up, that they can speak in faith and see that mountain moved. You got a group of people that can get something done in life. They can get something done in their family and their kids and their, and their grandkids, people that they love dearly. They want to stand back and say, no, I don't want no part of that. All I've ever seen is heartbreak and hurt out of, out of church people. Think about it. We don't want to do that. We want to build confidence in them that they can stand up and say, I'm a child of God. I may be wearing orange at this time, talking about the, the prisoners, but I'm a born-again child of God. I was sitting over there in the chaplain's office yesterday, and uh, I met two inmates coming in. They're real, you know, they're real prim and proper. They stand around and don't say a word. And we sat down in the, in the chaplain's office, and they just pretty much let me uh, tell them what I was all about and go through the motions of that. And, and I kept looking out of the corner of my eye, seeing what the inmates were going to do, because they're chaplain, uh, chaplain's assistants. They get to work in there. So I'm taking it they're born again if they got to get to work in there. And I got done... And and the chaplain got busy with a phone call, and one of them got up and he brought me a piece of paper that that he had he had taken a piece of paper like this and printed it out. You could tell he worked a, a long time on it because you can fold it up, you can fold it up in three or four different ways, and it was his testimony. He said, "Take that and read it." And I le- I read it before I left the the uh, parking lot. He was uh, about to get fifty years. For killing a man. I bet he wasn't 25 right now. And uh, it all worked out that he only got nine years to a lesser charge. And I don't know what all was going on. But he said he met a man in there. Now, there's people in, in, in the jails like this. He said, I met a man that was working out. He said, I wanted to work out, but I'm, I, I was a kid. He'd been in there for a long time, and he's just like 25 now. He said, I was a kid, and, and he said, I walked up and asked him, uh, can I work out with you? And he said, yeah. He said, but I've got one question for you. He said, well, what's that? And he, and he went into talking about, or do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And everybody in that jail respected him for where he stood with who he was. And he said, that man learned me a whole lot. He said, we've, we've got separated over the years, moving facilities. He said, but just, you can read it. I'll put it, I'll put it, get Missy, I'm going to get Missy to put it on the website. But it's amazing. One person with the right seed planted in them, that that seed blossoms to something that can affect the whole place. He, he told me, he said, I've got, a group that we studied together, and he pointed at the that the other assistant, which was the main assistant, that pretty much took the chaplain's place when the chaplain was out of the office. He said he's got four or five groups in this in this jail, and he said we do our best to to help these guys to do the same things wherever they go in this prison because there's there's sections all around that. I can't go in but one section on one day, and you can't get over here into the other section another day. So it's real, it's real blocked off. I don't know why they do it, but it's, that's, that's the way it is. And they want me to go into the annex. And he said, you can't talk to the people over here. He said, but the inmates get to move back and forth. So what I'm, what I'm getting at is if I can get in there and teach them the way I've been teaching in in Bradley County, now there's one in Osceola, Georgia, that just left there. And I know without a shadow of a doubt, he'll start a Bible study somewhere. And that seed that we spent 18 months sowing in them people, that seed will go to wherever he goes. And I think he's going to Virginia when he gets, when he gets finalized where he's going. That seed grows and it grows, and it grows, and before you know it, you've got men all over, the, all over the state, all over the nation, preaching and teaching that if you'll find out who you are, ain't nothing in this world can stop you. Now, I, I want to go to this last verse. 
And the uh, King James says, He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Give me that, the New Living Translation. It says, Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Amplified, please. It says, He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? What Paul was tell, saying right there, he give heaven's best to pay for you. Is he not going to take care of everything else? Is he not? People need to know that because they don't. Salvation's been preached and there's been millions upon millions of people that have been born again but yet did not know that God was going to handle anything else that would come up for them if they just have the same faith that they had to be born again. Right. Majority of the church don't know that. Why don't they know that? Because they don't know who they are in Him. They don't know where they stand in the whole scheme of things. They don't know that this game is fixed if they'll just play it. Because they got the judge on their side. They got the, 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 uh, the attorney, the defense attorney on their side. And they're all family. Think about it. My father's the judge. My savior's my attorney. And my savior paid for everything in the world to be taken care of on our own for my benefit and for everybody else who's on this world, in this world, will he not freely and graciously give us all other things? He will. I promise you, he will. He's opening doors all over this nation for us to tell these truths. I thank God for that. But there's people that need to understand that where they stand in their salvation could mean life or death for their family. Think, think about it. Where you, if you know where you stand, you can help your wife, your mother, your dad, your, your kids. But if you don't know where you stand, you can be in a world of hurt, a whole family in a world of hurt because I don't know where I'm at. I'm not going to live another day in that because my son went through hell because his daddy didn't know where, where he stood. My daughter ain't going to live that way. You understand what I'm talking about? My son done his dead level best to live up to his daddy's reputation. He far surpassed my reputation. But I told him today, I said, that young man is, is one of the most sound and grounded people that I know in this, in this whole world. And I said, it's all because of what this book has done for him. Not what his daddy done. Not what his mama done. Not where the, pla where the place that he's at done. But this book, this truth in this book. Now, I always do this. Every time I do a meeting or anything, I want to always give whoever's watching this video years and years down the road an opportunity. If you've never been born again and you want to have what this Word has been talking about for the last hour, and that is assurance, confidence, knowledge and wisdom to be able to stand up in the midst of all hell coming loose in your life. If you want to be able to do that, salvation is what you need. That's the door to the kingdom of life. That's the door to the kingdom of God. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He'll give us rest if we'll allow him to. But salvation is easy. 
Romans 10 and 9 says, If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you shall be saved. It don't say you might be if you're good enough. It don't say you might be if you cross all your T's and dot all your I's and do everything just perfect. It says if you'll confess him and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, period. It says for with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I say say this all the time in the jail. I said, don't just be silent about your salvation where you stand with God. Come to a place in your life that you want to tell everybody what Jesus Christ has done for you. Because I promise you, the more you tell it, the stronger you'll get in it. I've I've come to that conclusion. The more I talk about what God done in my life, the stronger I am that I can stand in who who I am. So tonight, if you've never been born again, make Jesus Lord of your life. Make him Lord of your life. And, and, And if you do, get in this study with us. Go to that podcast and, and go back to June the 21st of 2021 and go through these scriptures one by one and find out what God's Word says. Because I promise you, you're far more, you're far more in this life than you ever knew you could be in Christ Jesus. Be born again today. Now I'm going to sign off here and I want to thank Church Alive and all that they've done to give us a place to do this with. I want to thank Pastor Bob and Sandra for all that they have have allowed us to do right here. And I want to invite you to come on Sunday mornings at, at 1030 to 6315 Mouse Creek Road in Cleveland, Tennessee. If you live anywhere close to here, come find out. Just what this church is all about. Because I promise you, you're going to find one thing here. And that is God's love and people that will love you regardless of where you've been. So come and see us and we're going to sign off now.